so I'm going to be talking about um, scaling up semantics, lessons learned from the life sciences uh, from my perspective um, on a number of different um, projects that make use of, of different ontologies. So just to kind of like frame this, just as we all know, um, in the life sciences, we're generating more and more data, more and more knowledge. And we want to make, be able to make use of this. We want to be able to uh, make it accessible to machines so machines can help us interpret scientific data, make new hypotheses, discover uh, new ways to reposition drugs to, to treat diseases, maybe even to also help us understand how microbial life underneath the earth is contributing to uh, global, global uh, biogeochemical cycles and so on. But you know, we have a challenge because the way we as humans like to communicate is through words and pictures. And this is not um, chat GPT notwithstanding, it's still not very, uh, amenable to, uh, to machine processing, at least in a, in a particularly meaningful way. So we need to be able to digest um, all of these words into semantic structures so that they can be properly accessed by machines. So one of the uh, early efforts here was the, the gene ontology, um, which um, in a sense is trying to kind of tackle a problem of, of making a systems biology semantically understandable. So um, as I'm sure you know from some of the talks uh, earlier, earlier this, this conference, uh, the gene ontology is um, a large terminology of about 40,000 different classes describing different concepts in molecular biology and um, biology in general. And accompanying that ontology is a huge amount of um, curated experimental um, annotations and computed annotations that tell us uh, linkages between genes and these different concepts. So we can we can query and find um, all the genes involved in, say, receptor internalization to help us understand processes such as how viruses infect human cells. Um, and this, of course, goes to help uh, make data in the scientific literature more fair. But the gene ontology is just one of many different uh, ontologies that are, are used to um, help tackle this broader problem. So, you know, I work on a number of other ontologies, including, for example, the uh, Uberon multi-species anatomy ontology. This is a collaboration involving, um, in fact, some people here in, in Switzerland as well, the, the, the BG team, um, who are using Uberon to, to annotate uh, gene expression data across uh, about 50 or so different species. I also work on the, the Mondo disease ontology, the human phenotype ontology, and then moving slightly outside the biomedical realm, ontologies such as the ENVO environment ontology. Now, we don't develop these, these ontologies just for the sake of them. They're developed in combination with uh, knowledge bases and semantic resources, um, such as the gene ontology knowledge base. Um, I'm also a PI in the Monarch Initiative, which... Uh, seeks to curate uh, gene phenotype data across uh, a variety of species. And so, you know, the combination of these ontologies with these, these knowledge bases create um, semantic models of different aspects of, of biology. And as humans, we've always sought to kind of create models of our world and the, and the kind of like the, you know, the broader universe. So this is a, an early uh, mechanistic model of the, uh, the solar system from, I think, about um, second century, uh, uh, BC from, from Greece, which is an early example of an orrery, um, a device that seeks to model uh, the rotation of different planets uh, around the sun. Um, and, you know, in fact, this is not, um, not, not unique. There are many other kind of similar mechanisms that were, were developed, you know, across the, across the ancient world. And there was likely a lot of rediscovery and kind of like early communication of some of these kinds of models and the, uh, the mechanisms, uh, the technology for, for, for building them. So I want to kind of take this uh, this analogy a little bit further, and I want us to go on a little journey here of the uh, the semantic solar system. So here, imagine we're here on planet Earth, SWAT uh, for HCLS. We're kind of going around the sun, and there's some other uh, semantic modeling planets out here. So what what planets do we have? Well, we've got um, heard a lot about uh, planet knowledge graph uh, in this this conference already, and so this uh, this planet seeks to model things by by essentially modeling the things that are observed in, in the world. Um, we've also got, um, you know, we've heard a lot about this conference and, and also in some of the preceding days, um, planet semantic schema. So this seeks to model, um, not directly model the things themselves, but to model the, the information about the things. And then uh, also obviously a lot in the news right now, we've got the planet large la language model, uh, which is more like a, a model of, uh, of words. So all of these are different kind of like ways of approaching the problem of semantic modeling. So 
let's uh, start off on planet knowledge graph. So currently uh, in the solar system, this is um, a very hot planet. Uh, it's still, you know, after about 10 years, it's still, uh, you know, very kind of like a hot, exciting area of, of research. Sorry, I used Jupiter to depict this, and I guess Jupiter's not very hot, but just ignore that for now. But yeah, <laughs> so there's... Uh, this is an example of a, of a knowledge graph here. This is our COVID-19 uh, uh, knowledge graph. And um, uh, it's a little kind of like Google Trends showing um, showing the kind of like the, the, the impact of uh, the mentions of knowledge graph kind of going up over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, but of course, um, those of us here in this, uh, this audience, when we hear a lot of the buzz about the knowledge, knowledge graphs, we think, hey, we've, we've kind of been here before, you know, that... Less over 20 years or so since uh, since Tim Berner Lee's and Rosilla's uh, uh, seminal paper in Scientific American came out about the semantic web. So it's very tempting to just say, okay, yeah, roll our eyes and say this is just you know people ignore you know ignoring all the work we've done and kind of like just going off and doing their own things. But I think it's 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 important to look and see if this is just not as a as a branding exercise, but there's actually kind of like differences in this iteration around the sun. Um, there's and uh, I didn't know or I was going to be talking about similar some of these same things, so I'll, I'll maybe make some similar points. Um, but I think you know some some key points here are you know there's maybe less emphasis on URIs. URIs are one of the central components of the of the semantic web. They allow us to unambiguously identify things. This seems to be less important to people on this this iteration around. There's also more of an emphasis on scale, um, of course, more of an emphasis on property graphs over simple triples, more of an emphasis on machine learning and more graph theoretic algorithms rather than classical deductive uh, reasoning and knowledge representation style reasoning, and also more of an emphasis on kind of like shiny, shiny kind of like cool databases, uh, different graph databases perhaps at the, the expense of, uh, of standards. And of course, um, you know, perhaps kind of like evolving at the same time as, as the early semantic web, uh, we have a number of different kind of bioontologies, including, for example, the gene ontology, which actually had its start in uh, 99, perhaps even like 1998, um, which was conceived of originally as more like a, a knowledge graph, a graph of different concepts connected by different uh, relationship types. And of course, the gene ontology is part of a, a constellation of different ontologies uh, that many people don't realize they're not developed in isolation, but they are actually highly, highly interconnected. So the gene ontology depends on and um, relies on other ontologies, such as uh, the Kebi uh, ontology of uh, biochemical entity of chemical entities. And the gene ontology, in turn, is used by other ontologies like the human phenotype uh, ontology. And these uh, these kind of interactions are all mediated by um, a group called the, uh, the, the Obo Foundry that seeks to uh, coordinate the development and, uh, and the standards by which these different ontologies can link together. So one, um, one development I find very exciting is this kind of move, um, you know, led by people like Andra to try and include more Obo ontologies within, uh, within Wikidata, try and kind of like synchronize them, synch uh, synchronize the content so that we get the benefits of, of crowdsourcing, but also the benefits of just putting something in a in a very large uh, knowledge graph that encompasses not just biomedical knowledge, but all you know uh, the sum total of knowledge of 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 you know of of, of all humanity. So um, you can see in here you've got kind of Go concepts like um, glucan biosynthetic process uh, from the Go has its own representation. In um, in Wikidata, um, this is essentially showing the the underlying triples in Wikidata here. And what's nice is that it's actually showing some of these uh, linkages across ontologies as well that again come from uh, the gene ontology. So glucan glucan biosynthesis in the Go is actually connected to the concept glucan in uh, in the Kebi uh, ontology. Um, although I think you know some of these. Uh, some of these kind of like dates are maybe kind of like a little bit out of date. So, you know, one of the things we're going to be working on here is refreshing some of these, these linkages. Um, and in fact, we're going to be working on kind of like bringing in even more ontologies into, into Wikidata. So the, the next one up is Envo, the environment ontology. Um, and um, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of, of overlap there. So we have actually um, a Slack workspace for Obo, and we've got a channel there. Uh, for uh, for Wikidata, if you want to kind of like join us and help um, think about how we can bring more of this kind of like 
more maybe more formal kind of like detailed biological knowledge from these ontologies into uh, broader sources like uh, like Wikidata. So um, triple source are also another great way of being able to to query some of this this data. We've actually created um, a, um, we've actually kind of deployed a, a new uh, a new triple store. Uh, this is led by uh, Jim Balhoff of Renzi, and it's called um, Ubergraph. So this brings together um, a subset of the ontologies in Obo. So we take a subset that are uh, designed to kind of like work well together and to kind of like cohere with each other, because we actually make use of reasoning to build this graph. And we use a technique called relation graph to pre-compute um, all transitive um, entailed relationships between concepts. And this makes it much easier to, um, to launch kind of queries that say things like, you know, find me all genes that maybe participate in a reaction that um, involves some kind of like polysaccharide or glucan or, or something like that. Um, and you can do kind of powerful queries on this using this, this simplified relational graph uh, graph modeling and do you know federated queries with some of the the other triple stores that we've we've heard about uh, during this uh, during this meeting. And this kind of shows just roughly um, the kind of scale of the different connections between some of the different ontologies. So you can see some of the key ones here are the gene ontology in Mondo, um, fish and yeast phenotype ontology, and mammalian and human phenotype ontologies on top all of them making heavy use of, of ontologies such as KEBI, which is natural given the, the centrality of chemical entities to, to, to all of science. So we've heard quite a bit about AL during this meeting, and there's, you know, we've maybe heard some kind of like skepticism about AL, but one thing I want to say is that we, we you know, within uh, the bioontologies world, we really love AL and we love, um, we love doing reasoning with AL. Maybe you don't see a lot of this because where we we actually use it is in the process of building and constructing and releasing these these ontologies. It's maybe less useful once ontologies are let out into the world um, um, because you've already done a lot of the the main reasoning. But they're actually it's actually incredibly useful for being able to do quality control over ontologies and to help automatically construct these ontologies. And this shows how we have a very modular kind of like software engineering oriented approach to, to building ontologies where we can leverage, uh, for example, the, the, the KEBI chemical ontology, leverage their classifications of, of polysaccharides like glucans and so on, such that these classifications are reflected within uh, the gene ontology. And it used to be really hard to kind of like set up your pipelines to be able to make use of our reasoning this way. But more recently, we've developed something called the, uh, the ODK, the Ontology Development Kit, and this makes it easier for mere mortals to get set up with um, an environment for building an ontology. And what it will do is it will seed you um, a GitHub repository with all of the, the things that uh, you know, a modern software developer would expect from a GitHub repository is ready set up with uh, GitHub actions so that people can come in and make pull requests on your ontologies. And those pull requests will get automatically checked using a battery of tools, using tools like Robot, using our reasoners. And we're doing this as part of a kind of like a drive to really open up ontology development. One people, thing people don't realize is um, a lot of these ontologies on Oboe, uh, they're all managed in GitHub. Well, the vast majority of them are. And not only can you go into any of these ontologies, issue trackers and say, hey, I don't like how you've placed this term under here, or I think you need a new term under this one, but you can actually go in and you can make pull requests on these ontologies. And I think this is you know, a really exciting development in terms of like just opening up these ontologies and um, having them be more kind of like democratic and kind of, um, you know, community uh, built by members of the, uh, of the community. So um, if you're interested in that, I urge you to check out the, uh, the ODK. So another um, newish development that can be, you know, seen within the kind of like wider realm of kind of like uh, knowledge graphs is kind of systems biology knowledge graphs in the form of gene ontology causal activity models. So this is um, a new development in annotation within the gene ontology, whereas historically, we've had a very simple kind of triple oriented annotation model, subject gene, uh, object go term, maybe some kind of like reification on the triple to describe the, the evidence of how these things are associated. This doesn't really truly capture the way in which genes act together as part of an ensemble, 
to um, you know a map a map kinase um, cascade. You know, one gene is phosphorylating another, is phosphorylating another. So we've developed this new data model for being able to describe how genes work together to achieve biological objectives. And this is called GoCam, the uh, Gene Ontology Causal Activity Model. Um, and this makes heavy use of, of other ontologies within OBO. It allows you to describe your cellular context of your, of your gene interactions using the cell ontology, using the uh, um, Uberon anatomy ontology, the plant ontology, and so on. Um, and um, in fact, under the hood, we are using uh, RDF in our, our modeling here. This is quite a granular kind of like A-box oriented model where you can see um, the lower level here is the actual kind of like instance graph. And we're actually making use of concepts uh, from, from Uniprot, from, from the gene ontology, from other ontologies here, uh, to be able to kind of like link these things in contextual views. And so we don't expose obviously this kind of triple oriented view to the biologists. They have a, a graphical interface where they can uh, manipulate these kinds of things. And then, you know, we have an even simpler view for, uh, for biologists who are looking at this on the web. So this is an example from uh, the Alliance of Genome Resources. If you look at the the TB uh, the page for the TBK1 gene, um, you can see we've got um, a number of these GoCams annotated, and they're visible as these kind of like uh, kind of classic kind of pathway gene interaction models. But one of the key differences here is that all of these edges are are annotated using um, using terms from the the gene ontology. And we've also worked on with methods to be able to import. Um, all of the, the human reactions and human pathways within Reactome into this uh, GoCam uh, triple model. Um, and you can read more about that here. And just, oh, just to kind of go back quickly, there is um, a Sparkle endpoint here, rdf.geneontology.org, if you're interested in using this. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of like, you know, planet knowledge graph back to, you know, the, um, history from the kind of like late 1990s onwards. But, you know, there's been other iterations of this of this planet. If we kind of go back, you know, even as far back as the, the 1950s, um, you know, you could just see knowledge graphs as a rebranding of a kind of concept that came out of the Cambridge uh, Language Research Unit in the 1950s called Semantic Networks. Um, so there was a paper by actually a Cambridge botanist, uh, Richard Richens, on pre-programming from mechanical translation, which can be seen as maybe one of the first uh, knowledge graphs where he designed uh, different kinds of structures for being able to represent English phrases like the cat sat on the mat or the, the cat is being bitten by the dog. And this group actually kind of like developed, you know, some of the, the first known kind of uh, computational uh, thesauri. And the emphasis there was maybe more on, um, on machine translation. We can go back even further, you know, back to like about the third century, um, of the, of the common era, when we've got kind of like philosophers like uh, Pori Fairy, who came up with, you know, one of the first ontologies um, or knowledge graphs, you know, where we classify things as, you know, substances, bodies, animals, humans, and then you've got kind of instances in your, your A box at the bottom there with kind of instances such as uh, Plato and so on. And, you know, maybe the, you know, obviously the emphasis there wasn't on making structures computable. It was maybe more driven by kind of like theological and philosophical concerns rather than uh, than computation. But hopefully we've we've moved past some of that. So you know you can see some of these ideas kind of like rotating like planets around uh, around the sun in the the solar system. And you know I think we've got a couple of options. We can choose to be kind of curmudgeons about this and say you know we can be like can commute and try and turn back the tide and say, look, we've all done this before. We should stick to using the same technologies, the same standards and so on. Or, you know, we can maybe just kind of embrace the change and kind of like just ride the wave and, you know, just kind of have fun with some of these, uh, these newer standards and technologies. Um, but in a way that maybe preserves some of the good ideas that have come out of the semantic web and kind of like moves them forward onto, onto some of these, uh, these newer technologies. So one kind of like general idea I've been trying to promote is this idea of promoting and embracing queries as, as a way of kind of like keeping URIs alive in this kind of post URI kind of property graph universe. So, you know, as we heard yesterday, um, even though URIs are obviously wonderful and they act as core uh, identifiers within the RDF universe, this idea of using a URI as an identifier is maybe a little bit, a little bit alien to, um, to a lot of people in the, in the bioinformatics world. Um, and it's also very awkward to work with URIs as identifiers in tooling that doesn't come from the RDF st 
um, spec, if you've ever tried to kind of make URIs identifiers in something like a, a Neo4j database, you'll know what I mean. So I think queries are a nice solution here. So, and in fact, you know, we've been using prefixed IDs even in bioinformatics, even before uh, the semantic web, you know, you'll see many um, in the literature, maybe many people will just report things as, you know, IDs like uh, go colon, you know, followed by the number, um, and we've been making use of IDs like Uniproc colon P12345 you know, for a, a long time now. But one of the keys, key things here is that it's always necessary to keep your prefix map explicit because otherwise you've just got a string and, and not um, a URI. And there's been some nice developments here, including some work led by Charlie Hoyt on, um, on the bio registry, um, which seeks to kind of like come up with some standard uh, prefixes across the, the, the biomedical sciences. And of course, you know, I, I think having a single registry for all prefixes probably isn't going to scale for, you know, for all, all, all of science. So I think the key here is to have mechanisms such that you can be flexible and you can have different kinds of prefix maps for, for different kinds of, uh, of scenarios. And this is where the, uh, the prefix maps project comes in. Then another thing that, you know, I find maybe quite sad is like when, as we adopt um, some of these newer knowledge graph technologies, we tend to just kind of like throw out a lot of the good work that has been done with, uh, with actual semantics in the, in the semantic web. So, um, you know, as we all know, RDF um, and Al provide a lot of the, um, the original notion of semantics in the, uh, in the semantic web. Um, that's the story anyway, but in reality, you know, Al, is fantastic for maintaining terminologies like uh, like the the gene ontology and Mondo and so on, but there's 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 some issues in using Al. Uh, one of the things is that the layering on RDF can be a little bit problematic and kind of awkward, and and also Al is is great for doing this kind of like terminological knowledge, but it's less good for the kinds of complex contingent knowledge that we tend to have in the life sciences. So here's. Um, Here's an example of how people um, who are just kind of like approaching property graphs without some of the knowledge of, of ontologies in the semantic web might choose to model something like the solar system. And you know, say, okay, I've got some nodes for concepts like planet, solar system, galaxy. I'm going to connect them up with uh, edge labels like part of. But this doesn't actually capture the kind of like the quantification, the kind of rules that tell you if, uh, if I am a planet, then I am necessarily part of a solar system. And it doesn't capture... Uh, things like transitivity of these these relationships. Um, so historically, we've done this using languages like OWL that make this quantification very explicit. So we say things like, you know, um, the class of planets is a subclass of things that are part of some solar system, um, and the class solar system is a subclass of things that are part of the galaxy. So um, all very nice. This kind of thing is reasonably easy to teach to uh, to biologists and bio curators. Things start to get a little bit complex once you start layering this um, this owl into you know our nice simple kind of like RDF graphs. So one of the promises of RDF is this is simplicity, but sometimes this kind of pushes complexity into into odd areas. This is what um, this is what our simple owl model looks like when you layer it as um, as individual triples. All of a sudden, you've got these striped model with blank nodes intervening between your kind of like concepts of in interest. So a planet's a subclass of a blank node that is of type restriction that's on property part of and some values from solar system. And this this kind of thing like really confuses, um, you know, when we try and kind of like, you know, expose, you know, ordinary kind of like um, data scientists and bioinformaticians to uh, owl ontologies uh, layered on RDF, it really, it, it confuses them and you know you can teach people to overcome this but it's actually a really difficult structure to work with it's not amenable to doing just very simple kinds of transitive graph querying to you know do things like what kinds of things are found in the galaxy you end up having to use owl reasoners in kind of like odd ways in in combination with this so maybe we can actually you know treat this kind of revolution around the around the sun and this kind of like move towards property graphs as as a way of thinking about how we can have maybe alternate ways of layering on the semantics and even alternate semantics. So this is how you know things tend to be modeled in, in triple stores like Wikidata, which adopt a simpler, more knowledge graph-like model. Um, but we can take advantage of the fact that we're using property graphs now and actually put our semantics on the edges rather than in these intervening blank nodes. And we've come up with um, a proposed um, 
you know, standard here. It's more of a kind of a conversational starting point called Owl Star. And the idea is this is a different way to layer owl semantics onto uh, onto property graphs that makes it you know, a lot more friendly for uh, computational use. And you can actually take advantage of RDF star um, and actually kind of like uh, you know render this as, as RDF star triples, which I think look a little bit nicer than the, the standard RDF layering. And hopefully in future, um, once we see the, um, the one graph standard come out, you know, maybe we can kind of uh, come up with uh, a standard way of layering this with uh, with one graph, and we can even use this for um, um, for for modeling other kinds of of semantics that don't really fit so well into this kind of like deductive first order logic model theoretic framework that we use in in RDF and AL. So a lot of this has been written about by uh, Stefan Schultz and Alan Rector and so on. Just how challenging it is to model what we might think of as Simple statements like the the gene uh, the gene product LMO2 interacts with the gene product ELF2. You can actually go down some real rabbit holes in trying to model these. Um, and so again, I think property graphs gives us an opportunity to think about ways in which we can maybe even bring back some of these ideas from earlier iterations around the sun, where before everything was all about kind of model theory and deductive reasoning. Maybe there's other kinds of reasoning, like uh, defeasible reasoning, kind of like you know, you know, you know, Bayesian reasoning, and so on, that we can layer in rather than having everything be um, strictly based around uh, model theory. And so, along with the semantics, I think we need um, um, you know a, a set of of kind of like standard categories that we can use within our knowledge graphs. So this led us to develop something called the uh, the BioLink model, which is a set of kind of like hierarchical categories for use in knowledge graphs. So you can see this kind of maybe a little bit like um, like an, an upper ontology, uh, but we designed this really in um, as a collaboration with kind of non-ontologists, with kind of like people who are experts in these different domains. And we want to come up with something that was like maybe less abstract than some of the upper ontologies out there. And something that was also more amenable to this kind of um, property graph style way of, of thinking. And so we're actually making use of uh, BioLink within this uh, National Center for Advancing Translational Science Biomedical Translator. We heard about from um, Elif's great talk uh, yesterday. So the basic idea here is to build a federated infrastructure for being able to make, um, to kind of answer, to, to, to make complex biological queries about, you know, finding me the, the different mechanisms underpinning how a particular genetic variant may affect um, you know, our ability to um, to metabolize um, different drugs and how that can can impact treatment and so on. And so this is a federated approach involving a number of different groups with different uh, knowledge sources, different ways of computing over these. And we needed a kind of standard to to be able to integrate this uh, together. And so the BioLink model like largely came out of the work of this this group. And we even have a kind of fledgling user interface now where you can uh, do some of these kind of like uh, federated queries. All right, so on to the, the next planet here, uh, planet semantic schema. So the basic idea here is that um, uh, we want to be able to model um, not, not so much the things themselves, but the model, uh, the actual ways in which the structures we use in which to, to describe those things using um, kind of technologies that I think many of us here are familiar with, like shackle, shacks, uh, shape languages, and so on. And you, know, you can see this as being the next iteration um, you know, around, around, around the sun here, where maybe in the past some of us attempted to, to use OWL. We were maybe sold a bit of a false bill of goods. Some people, they were told that OWL could be used as a, as a schema language when it's really, that is not the intent of OWL. OWL is um, a language for modeling a domain in an, in an open world fashion. And when you try and use it um, in, a, in a closed world fashion, you essentially get into, into difficulties. And this has led some people maybe to be a little bit bitter about this and the they're kind of like criticizing Al, and you see these tweets like, you know, I'm never going to touch Al again. Shackle does everything I need to, which I think just shows that, you know, maybe, yeah, I think people just need to have a better understanding of the the, the right fit for some of these different different um, different technologies. But you know, in fact, um, you can see um, some of these shape languages as you know another iteration of kind of going back to the '90s, things like frame languages. So. Protege before it was an owl editor was actually um, um, a frames editor. And a lot of people actually, you know, quite like this. And frames themselves, you know, have a history 
dating back to the uh, to the 1970s. You can kind of go back to Marvin Minsky's kind of like original paper on frames. Uh, there's a nice review on this um, from from the from the 1990s, and you can see some of the structures here. Yeah, uh, we've not really moved on so much since then. At the end of the day, we've got kind of like we've got classes and the, the classes of different slots in which we stick different values and we want to kind of constrain these in certain ways such that we can um, have predictable communication between information systems. And we really need this more than ever because the number of different databases, the number of different standards just keeps on growing and growing. Um, and you know what is maybe even more frustrating is that a lot of these standards that you see in standards repositories like fair sharing, they don't um, really have any kind of like formal schema or validators associated with them. They're what I would call PDF standards. Maybe if you're lucky with some of the older ones, there's an XML schema attached. Maybe some of the newer ones, there's a, a JSON schema. Even in these cases, they're kind of underspecified a lot of the time. They don't really uh, describe how they bind to different ontologies in different ways. Um, and you know, you might think, well, you know, we, this is a good opportunity for using checks and shackle here. But the challenge is that a lot of data exchange in the biosciences, you know, maybe isn't, you know, doesn't use RDF as the primary mechanism. People like to use things like uh, JSON and TSV as their as their exchange standards. And you know, the end result of this is that we, uh, when we try and actually do something like a meta analysis, so this is, we tried to do this meta analysis where we looked at composition of different uh, microbiome communities as different environmental parameters varied. So we took um, data from uh, the, the NCBI, EBI biosample database. Um, because the underlying standards here were not computable, people were just able to jam any old kind of crap into, into these databases. So if you actually try and analyze a field like depth, you'll see all kinds of kind of just crazy things have been, uh, been rammed into, into this field. So um, this was one of the, the, you know, the impetuses for creating uh, the LinkML, the Link Data Modeling Language. So the basic idea here was to make it very easy for, um, for bioinformaticians, biocurators to create um, a data exchange standard uh, by simply authoring a, um, a YAML file um, that essentially kind of follows something more like um, one of the, you know, the, and the ideas from the, the early uh, frame type systems where you've got concepts like classes and slots and so on. Um, and then the idea was to make it optional to annotate these with ontologies. So we don't try and kind of force ontologies uh, onto people using this, but we make it very easy for them to gradually layer in more and more semantics as they become uh, more comfortable. Um, one of the key features here is something we call a polyglot modeling. And the basic idea is that we can compile this framework into, into frameworks that other people may be familiar with. So JSON schema, for various reasons, is very, very popular um, uh, you know, amongst, uh, amongst data scientists. People also like having things like pedantic models and data classes for, uh, for their models. People like modeling things with relational databases. So we've got ways of compiling to these. And we've also got ways of compiling to uh, shape language, JSON-LD context as well. So you no longer have to separately maintain your JSON-LD context and your, and your shapes. You can do it all in one single overarching framework. So the basic idea is that we can um, annotate some of these schemas with ontologies like schema.org. So you can actually um, describe the different elements you know, without it being completely in your face. You can also easily define what we call a value set. So you can have essentially pick lists. There are strings that you know, may be in some kind of drop-down interface during data entry, but behind the scenes, these are mapped to, um, to concepts in different, uh, different ontologies. And you can even have more um, kind of like um, advanced value sets that are defined dynamically based on essentially kind of queries from different ontologies. So you can say, for example, this field in this standard needs to have um, a term that is in a descendant of the concept neuron in, in the cell ontology. So this, this framework makes it um, aims to make it easy to, to do things like this. And so, as I mentioned, you can serialize your model in different uh, object-oriented programming frame, frameworks like Python data classes, Pydantic, SQL DDL, but also um, Shex and Shackle and so on. And you can use this as, um, as an exchange framework as well. And it makes it very easy to go back and forth between TSV, JSON, YAML, um, and RDF serializations of your, of your data. There's a growing um, tool chain associated with this, um, different ways for being able to kind of like you know, automatically generate schemas from data. 
you know, generate user interfaces from schemas as well, um, and different kind of like paradigms for, for reasoning over, over some of these things. Um, and we're starting to see adoption over a number of different groups. So some of these were our own projects, like um, the National Microbiome Data Collaborative um, and the Monarch Initiative. But we're starting to see kind of like uh, this, you know, uh, even more and more uptake from a number of different groups. Um, including uh, the, you know, this is one of the, the key original use cases, the NMDC, where this is really driving our kind of like our entire database and um, data submission system, where all of the different elements in the database are described using uh, LinkML. So we, um, you know, I'd, I'd really like to kind of invite all of you here to kind of join this community. We're um we've got kind of like a slack group we've got um you know we've got um our github organization um and you know the the aim here is really to be kind of as, as open and welcoming as possible to everyone and we've got yeah i see a number of people um in the audience today who have been helping contribute to this okay so for the final um um planet on our journey through the solar system here is maybe um planet la large language model so this is definitely you know ultra hot planet at the moment you know obviously this is the news a lot this is this makes use of kind of like uh you know transformer architectures and so on and you know we've seen lots of you know i think many of us have, were initially quite impressed by chat gpt but then uh maybe slightly uh, dissuaded when we saw the extent to which it can kind of kind of hallucinate and you can also see this in terms of kind of like yeah you know, we've been around, you know, those of us who've been around a while have kind of like seen some of this before, you know, with the, the first AI winter, you know, suddenly there's a lot of hype and then you end up kind of like spending a lot of money to to support these things. But, you know, again, I think we can see this as, as an opportunity. I think it's clear from, you know, you know, some of the kind of like things that we've seen with Jet GPT so far that it truly lacks any kind of like semantic understanding. It's just kind of stringing words together like a stochastic parrot, all being a very very kind of like an impressive way, but maybe we can meld this technology with semantic technologies to kind of create something uh, something newer as well. So we've been playing with um, um, developing a fun framework called uh, Onto GPT, and the basic idea is to combine some of these uh, ultra large language models with semantic structures. And so this essentially is um, an ontology layer on top of the uh, the Open AI uh, GPT three AI. So it um, there's a number of different components to this. Um, one of them is called Spires, the Stochastic Parrot Interrogation and Recursive Extraction of Semantics, Halo, Hallucinating Latent Ontologies. And also we've been doing some experiments with kind of like just authoring knowledge graphs using, um, using GitHub Copilot, which makes use of the OpenAI codex um, behind the scenes. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this one, algorithm Spires. And the basic idea here is that we may want to extract um, information from text into not just simple triples, but kind of arbitrary deep um, deep knowledge structure. So the idea is that you can create um, um, a schema describing some kind of like domain. Um, this example here shows a schema for a, a recipe. It's described in, in LinkML. Um, and a recipe is described compositionally in terms of different parts. So a recipe has different ingredients and it has different steps. Those different steps make use of different kind of um, food items that are measured, maybe have different um, or tuples of, qu of quantities and, and also different kind of like food types and so on. And then you want to describe the terminal nodes using, using kind of standard IDs or standard ontology concepts, such as in this case, the, the food on ontology from, from Obo. And so the idea here is that we can take um, some kind of like text, it may be structured, it may be semi-structured, um, and then you can actually like feed this um, to the OpenAI API, um, making use of kind of like um, auto-generated prompts that um, get around some of the hallucinatory abilities of, of OpenAI by essentially just kind of like asking, hey, OpenAI, just kind of extract from this text uh, all of the different ingredients, um, all of the different kind of like food quantity pairings, and you essentially kind of like recurse through and kind of feedback the answers back into, into the engine again. And then what, um, what ChatGPT GPT is actually terrible at is anything involving identifiers. It will just kind of, if you ask it for a Go ID for something, it will just hallucinate a random kind of like string of numbers or maybe give you the most popular Go ID. So this is where we kind of like bring in some of our more 
uh, traditional technologies and we can make use of the bioportal annotator or the ontology access kit annotator um, to essentially take some of the the pre um, the pre parse structures and turn them into um, into identifiers and then you can do another pass through this where you can kind of feed it through some mapping so you end up with a um, either some uh, some JSON or RDF or you can pass it through something that will give you um, a nice kind of like um, owl T box rendering of 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 this and so this is um, this is some kind of like results here so the results are maybe a bit iffy but what I find interesting is it actually helps highlight some of the gaps that we have in some of these existing ontologies like food on see many of the the steps here of, of concepts have, have not been tagged with uh, with food on so you know we've tried um, some evaluating this against some standard kind of like corpuses like uh, the the biocreative chemical disease uh, relation extraction task. It, at the moment, it does kind of like so-so, but I think what is impressive is this is a, you know, essentially a zero-shot learning approach. So it doesn't actually require any training data. Um, you're literally just asking it to, to kind of extract the structures directly from, um, from text. All right, so um, just some kind of parting thoughts here um, as we roll towards the end. So, you know, I'm I'm very interested in kind of like helping us as a community come up with, with standards for being able to kind of exchange data in ways that are kind of like semantic and computable. But you know, this is this is the, not the first time that we've we've tried doing something like this. If you go back, um, I don't know how many people here were involved in some of these early efforts in the in the 1990s, groups like the Life Sciences Research uh, Consortium group, um, whose um, aim was to come up with a bunch of different CORBA uh, models um, in the CORBA interface definition language for exchanging data, maybe later on moving towards kind of like technologies like here they say XML and EJB, I guess that's enterprise Java beans for anyone who remembers that. But, and you can actually go on web archive and go back and look at the original FAQ. And, you know, even this effort in the 1990s was not the first to try and standardize, but they said, okay, well, why will we succeed? Rather it's a failed and it's because we're, we're gonna use these technologies like CARBA, they're gonna be around forever. And, you know, what happened to CARBA, I don't know, who remembers CARBA here? That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there might even be a few, few people still using this. So, but yeah, I think a lesson here is that, you know, I think we've, we've got to be open to kind of embracing change. And I think, you know, you, we can do this in such a way that we preserve a lot of the great ideas from the semantic web and bring them forward um, into kind of like newer technology stacks. Because at the end of the day, why? Why, why is it only you know, people who use a triple store that get to have semantics? Why can't people who are using big, data, big table also have semantics as well? Maybe we can be creative and come up with mechanisms to, to layer semantics onto some of these other technologies rather than keeping them all the semantics to ourselves. And so we really need to do this. We really need all of the different technologies, all of the different communities that are using these technologies if we're going to scale up and be able to model all of the different data in the biosciences. So really need this, this open and inclusive approach. And so with that, I really just wanna thank um, a number of people. The number of people is just way too many to thank. Um, a lot of this is work of kind of like, you know, working groups and consortia and so on. So um, I do wanna call out a few people like Nico Matanzoglu from, um, from Obo um, and people like uh, Deepak Uni here and Sierra Moxon uh, for their work on the BioLink model and uh, Justin Reese uh, for his work on knowledge graphs. Um, and um, Harold over here has been one of the, the key developers in, uh, in the LinkML ecosystem. And uh, with that, I'll finish and take any questions. So thanks, it was really, uh, really nice. And all in all, I think we live in a pretty good solar system, right? Mm -hmm. We uh, do, yeah. <laughs> uh, so but I want to press on one, which is maybe a detail, your uh, dig at URIs versus queries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I was the first one yesterday to say, oh, I know, semantic web, semantic works, the web not, right? But mm -hmm. isn't it going a little bit too far to ditch the URIs altogether? Because um, after all, it is a nice feature that you can actually, you know, ping a URI and see if anybody's home at a remote endpoint yeah. and mm -hmm. get information back. And with these queries, you've lost this completely. So are you then not just condemned to storing copies of everything locally on your uh, local stores. Uh, so yeah, no, 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 thrown no. away mm. a lot of the baby with the bathwater now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So maybe I can kind of clarify some of that point. So the goal is not to not to throw out URIs. URIs are fantastic and we should 
you know, probably continue to have resolvable URIs. Um, but the, the idea is rather the, to make it easier for people to use these URIs, maybe without even realizing that they're using them. Because people in bioinformatics will just exchange kind of like ID strings kind of like in a fairly, fairly ad hoc way, you know, without any kind of like, you know, constraining mechanism. But if we... It, it, it does, but the, um, the goal here is maybe to take that prefix mechanism and to kind of like bring it forward into into other technologies and to kind of retroactively paste it onto an existing database that may be using kind of like uniproc colon p1234 in an ad hoc way and saying look let's let's take what you're doing let's not change it but let's let's add in this extra layer let's add a prefix table into your database and 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 then you're all of a sudden you're using URIs um, you know, in a way that doesn't kind of like disrupt people and force people to use these very long strings everywhere. Yeah. Mm. Chris and I have regular debates about this and, and I'm very much on your side. I have no trouble with uh, curies as long as there's a definitive prefix map that, that a permalink to a prefix map so that I can turn it into URIs. The notion of uh, assuming that excess forever is, and you know, excess colon is going to ex be, be XML schema, uh, let alone the fact that everybody uses EX colon for experimental data that's always a different URI means that we really need a mechanism to tightly bind prefix maps. Hello, my name is Leith Abunawaz. I'm working with uh, UNIL uh, and SIP. And I would like to thank you for this great presentation. It's really an eye-opening of our around uh, the solar system as you describe it. And I would like to ask you regarding the Neo4j that you ask about why there is no semantics. I I'm not sure if you uh, got the opportunity to try what they started recently about the Neo semantics. And I don't know if you have experience to share with the group and using that of, or anyone had uh, the exposure to try that. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. I have to admit, um, I, I'm actually not familiar with that, that effort. So um, now you say it, it's kind of ringing a bell. <laughs> I'm ashamed to admit, I, I'm not familiar with that and I feel we need to hook up with them, yeah. I really enjoyed your talk. Lots to uh, think about here and lots of notes. Uh, so if as a community, we are all modeling data, you know, people in this room um, and trying to pull things together. Uh, as you mentioned, there are, you know, literally thousands of different ontologies and people are inventing new things all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you're also talking about some of the solutions, right? Link ML, uh, Shex, uh, Shackle and whatnot. So how do we as a community start to pull this together into something that's cohesive? Everybody kind of doing their own thing. It's kind of um, a bit rowdy. If you want to have a, a lot of good interoperability of, of mm. tools and data we have to do things in a common way so how do we get there yeah i mean it's 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 a challenge there's there's kind of like technological approaches but i think ultimately it comes down to more kind of community and social approaches so you know as as a member of the the obo consortium you know i i want to promote the oboe way of doing things here. And I think maybe people have, oboe's got a bit of a bad rap because in the early days it was it was kind of like, you must use the basic formal ontology and everything must be ontologically perfect. But we've we've moved on a lot since then. And, and it's more about building um, you know, a community around um, different kind of open standards and different kind of like ways of being kind of open about their development. So rather than a group just going off into a huddle for five years and coming up with the standard, we try and do things openly yeah, using something like GitHub where the decisions are, you know, requirements are kind of posted up front. You know, we people can make pull requests, they can make and they can make um, you know, they can have open discussions about some of these things. So I think doing it in that 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 manner is it's not, you know, it's not it's not uh, sufficient, but it's 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 definitely going to be necessary for for building these open standards and removing some of this this kind of duplication. But I I it's yeah. There's <laughs> there's so many other challenges. <laughs> yeah, well, just to pile on a little bit, uh, I, I I'm pretty impressed with what's been happening in GitHub over the past couple of years, and I wouldn't underestimate the the impact that it's having on on unifying communities and 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 fields. Uh, so much of what we're doing is 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 much more exposed and available, and uh, I I think that's playing a huge role in what's going to happen in the future. 
Hi, Chris. Uh, so super talk is really nice to see uh, this collection of work and technologies that you've been developing, uh, which is really, I think, advancing the semantics interest uh, across many communities. I think one of my questions uh, is a lot of the work that uh, that you've been driving and, 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 and your collaborators are often in the more informal sense. Um, they are, you know, you get together with your colleagues, you hack out some specs, you put them up there and they're mm -hmm. available and then people start adopting them. But they're also prone to change mm -hmm. uh, as people figure out maybe it doesn't work right, we need to refine it. And I want to hear your comment about the relationship between sort of informal progressive development versus more standards development where indeed people huddle they figure it out they put out a standard mm -hmm. and it's backed by you know companies and so on they're like we're going to implement it for better or for worse <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. and it's going to stay like that for a long time like mm -hmm. rdf and ow and things yeah. like that mm -hmm. so where do you see the standards um process with respect to the work that you are doing here yeah so i'm um, i mean i'm less familiar with some of the I mean obviously I consume a lot of W3C standards and ISO standards and so on I have less kind of familiarity with kind of like you know participating in those but I I feel with a lot of the the biomedical standards the the technology is changing so fast and the needs and the requirements are changing so fast it doesn't lend uh, itself so well to some of these more kind of like slower kind of like you know adoption processes and then you often end up with a kind of like a product that is harder to kind of like migrate at the at the end of the day. I'm I'm talking here more more about the not not the kind of like the core underlying kind of like standards themselves, but more some of the ontologies and some of the the, the different data models. And of course, with an ontology, yeah, you know, it really has to be yeah. You know, at least when when I say ontology, I mean the kind of terminological ontologies we find in OBO. These really have to be dynamic. Um, kind of like things, you know, there's most of the ontologies in Oboe, they, there's a release every month or so, and there's always kind of like new concepts that you need to you need to add. But I think for some of the, you know, for, you know, for example, for something like you know, Alstar, I think that would really benefit from something like, um, you know, some kind of like more formal kind of W3C, ISO, whatever kind of like a process to, to adoption. But the, and the, the versioning thing is definitely a challenge. And we've kind of like tried adopting different versioning schemes for different kinds of artifacts. So within OBO, we have more like a kind of like ISO date based versioning scheme. But for our, our schemas, we tend to always use semantic versioning. And that that's kind of like working out for us fairly well. It doesn't all, it's not always easy to map software engineering concepts uh, in terms of like major changes and so on into, into into other kinds of uh, semantic standards, but that's been working us for us fairly well. Mm -hmm.